I'll have you at this time turn in your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. We completed chapter 24 last week, and so we begin a new chapter. Now, it's probably important at this juncture to mention that in the original translation of the Scriptures from their original uh, text, there were no uh, chapter breaks. So, really, it's important from chapter 24 to see it as a continuation in chapter 25. So, once you've found your way there, we're going to be uh, in verses 1 through 13. I'll have you stand and follow along with me as I read our text. Okay, Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, Jesus is speaking, and Matthew is recording. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones... Uh, took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise, verse 4, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then, verse 7, all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But, verse 10, while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came, Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Father, we need for your Holy Spirit to give us understanding and insight into the passage we've just read. Will you, by your Holy Spirit, be our teacher and our guide this morning? as we seek to understand the message that you have for us at such a time as this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. And you may be seated. This is part A of a study entitled, The End of the World. It all started when, in the beginning of Matthew 24, the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, what will be the sign of your return and also of the end of the age or the end of the world. Again, I think it's important to note and know that Matthew chapter 24 continues on in chapter 25. Jesus is going now to parables to teach us and show to us what would be the signs of the end of the world and what it would be like at the time of the end, known as, and as the scripture calls it, in the last days. Well, as we've learned before, a parable is a way to come alongside a principle, para, like a paralegal comes alongside and helps, or a parachute, or a uh, 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 paramedic, to teach us the principle or to help us in the understanding of what it is that is set before us. So we have this parable of the ten virgins or synonymous with virgins are bridesmaids. So the brides in verses 1 and 2 are the church. Then also in verses 1 and 2, without a bride you have no bridegroom, but with a bride you have the bridegroom, and the bridegroom is none other than Jesus Christ. And then in verses 3 and 4 we're introduced to the brides having their lamps, five of which had oil and five of which did not. The oil in the scripture, in typology, is a symbol of, a type of, the Holy Spirit. 
And then in verses 5 and 6, we have this midnight cry where the bridegroom comes for the bride. This is speaking of the rapture, where Jesus Christ, as our bridegroom, as his church will come for us as a thief in the night, and in the night at this time in this event called the rapture to take us, to snatch us away. And then in verses 7 through 10, we see that the ready, the virgins, the brides that were ready, went. This is a picture of those who are born again of the Spirit of God. Because when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, He gives us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is then indwelling us as born again believers. In verses 11 through 12, though, we have the other five who are left behind at the rapture. This is a symbol of those who are not born again. And then in verse 13, we really have the lesson, the message. This is where the rubber meets the road, if you will. This is the lesson behind the parable, the principle that we need to learn in the parable, and it's simply this, and it's a warning to keep watch. Why? Because you do not know the hour of the bridegroom's return for his bride, as we'll see in a moment. Well, how do I, how do you, how do we keep watching? And what are we watching? We need to keep watching for the signs of the second coming, because if we're ready for the second coming, then sort of by default, we'll be ready for the rapture. I think it's interesting that there aren't really any signs that are for the rapture. In other words, it could happen at any time, again, by God's design. But there's all these signs for the second coming. See, there are things that still have yet to happen before the second coming of Jesus Christ. But since the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there has been nothing that has had to happen before the rapture. And again, by God's design, He's willed it that way, He's purposed it that way, so that we'll always keep watching and always be ready so that the Lord's return could be at any minute. Now, if I'm seeing signs already in place beginning to come to pass, then that tells me that the bridegroom is coming soon for his bride. See, if I'm seeing the signs again decorating the world for Christmas, I know that Thanksgiving is closer. See, Christmas would be like the second coming and the rapture like Thanksgiving. I like what Dave Hunt said regarding this. He said, opinions about the rapture do not affect salvation, but we should seek to understand what the Bible says. The early church was clearly expecting Christ at any moment to be watching and waiting for Christ if Antichrist must appear first would be like expecting Christmas before Thanksgiving. Yet Christ exhorted, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping, like interesting in this parable all ten brides were sleeping, and I, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Therefore, therefore is therefore a reason, because we do not know when he could come. He could come at any time. And when I watch the Middle East, and I watch particularly Israel, and the events more specifically as of late that are taking place in the Middle East, it tells me that the second coming of Jesus Christ is even at the door. And if I know that the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ comes before seven years before the second coming of Jesus Christ, then how close are we? I submit to you that we are so close that it has captured the attention of even the likes of none other than CNN. Just in the last couple of weeks, Paula Zahn had a uh, uh, series 
on the events in the Middle East, and it was entitled, Is It the End? She had many guests on her show, on her segment, on her Is It the End segment, but interesting, she had Joel Rosenberg, who will be speaking at the Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa uh, Prophecy Conference on her Is It the End segment. Now, Joel Rosenberg is a staunch a believer in the pre-tribulation rapture. And on Paul Azan's Is It the End segment, he said, quote, the rapture will happen first, then the Antichrist will rise to power. Now, on CNN, they went through a teaching, much like the teaching that we find ourselves in, in Matthew chapter 25, about the rapture. And, and it's a period when saved Christians are taken to heaven. And interesting, it could happen at any time. And he talked about the tribulation, that after the rapture, we'll have this period of war and suffering that will last for seven years. And this is when the Antichrist comes to power. And then you have at the end of the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon that takes place in the valley of Yezriel, or Megiddo where we get the word Mageddon, or Armageddon, and it's the final battle of good and evil. And the world as we know it is destroyed. And then there's a time of peace. It's the millennium. It's the millennial reign where Jesus Christ will rule, rule, <laughs> reign and us with him on earth, and the earth will be in its pre-fallen state as it was before Adam and Eve fell. And at this time, Jesus will rule the earth with us, the bride, those raptured. Then on CNN, Greg Beck, interesting. This was on July 26th on his nationally syndicated radio program, said, quote, here it is. Let me give you the setup. Some people believe that the Antichrist could come from the EU because in Daniel, the prophecy talks about the ten-point peace. Church, this is CNN. This is, and I don't know that Greg Beck is a professing believer, but isn't it interesting that those watching CNN are watching what they are watching, which is the Middle East, which is what Jesus told us to watch. Why? Because if we're watching the Middle East, and particularly Israel, as God's prophetic clock, it will show us and ready us because we know that if that second coming of Jesus Christ is close, then the rapture is even closer. Greg Beck goes on to say, quote, but there is a guy that in 1999 was appointed, <laughs> appointed to see over the foreign and security policy of the European Union. They had a document that created his position. The guy has a genius IQ. He's the author of 38 books kind of came out of nowhere, pretty powerful guy, everybody likes him, he's very media savvy, he's on the cutting edge, he's the bright up and comer of the European Union, he's playing a big role in the, from what I understand, in the Middle East this week, his name is <laughs> Javier Solana, great back, CNN, not a professing believer. He goes on to say, now, there were two things that happened in 1999. He was appointed with a document that created his position. Out of 1,100 of the documents from the council to create his position, the document number that created the role of the union in the world section one of the general report was bill number, document number 666. Yes, in 2000, he was given emergency powers with recommendation 666. This is over CNN, seen over all of the world, and they're talking about the Antichrist, and is it the end, and the coming of Jesus Christ? Well, at the end of this segment, Greg Beck ends by encouraging people to Google these things about Solana for themselves. And he says, look, Look him up, do your homework, follow him, well-respected guy, most likely not the guy out here in Salon. I'm hoping that the Antichrist isn't even alive, close quote. 
I heard him ask uh, someone else on another segment, do you believe the Antichrist is still alive? Or is presently alive right now uh, and about ready to come on the scene? And he's asking all these people on, on all these programs. I think it's pretty interesting. Well, another interesting uh, news article, you might have caught it again on CNN. This uh, key Republican uh, breaks with Bush on the Mideast. He's out of Nebraska. Uh, Senator Hagel calls for immediate ceasefire. This is on the 31st of July. And the article says, quote, he called on Bush to name a, what's this? A statesman of global stature. Oh! <laughs> As his personal envoy to the region. And he urged the administration to open direct talks with Hezbollah's backers in Iran both of which Washington also accuses of meddling in Iraq. What would cause a key Republican out of Nebraska to break with his party and come against Bush and demand that the administration appoint a, quote, statesman of global stature? Who do you think he has in mind, I wonder? Well, interesting. Here's the answer. This is from back in December of 2003 out of the European Institute, an immediate press release with the headline, We Cannot Fail the World. Listen to this. On December 16th, the European Institute presented the Transatlantic Leadership Award to Senator Chuck Hagel. Oh! Senator Hagel has been an outspoken proponent of the need for good U.S.-European relations. Dr. Javier Solana, Secretary General of the Council of the European Union and High Representative for the Common Foreign Security Policy, came from Brussels to present the award. Dr. Solana stressed that unlike some who have recently doubted the value of the enduring U.S.-European alliance or questioned the existence of the common values and interests, Senator Hegel admits publicly that the transatlantic alliance is irreplaceable. Speaking on last Friday's meetings of the European Council on the European Constitution and the adoption of the first European security strategy, the Solana Doctrine, he stated that the EU's message to the US is very clear. We want to be partners with the United States, and we are determined to attack the root causes of the ills befalling the world of today. In his remarks, Senator Chuck Hagel stated that the EU's strength and determination to advance a common foreign and security policy, which has frightened some American policymakers in the last few years, is a policy development, a positive development for both Europe and the US, making up the most important alliance in the history of mankind. These great th threats that we face today will not be met by, achieved by, nor won by one nation. Let me add, they will be achieved by a one-world government and a one-world religion and a one-world economy. And interesting to note, parenthetically, Senator Chuck Hagel from Nebraska has presidential hopes for 2008. And interesting, his chummy relationship being the recipient of this award from the European Institute vis-a-vis -vis none other than Javier Solana and his demand to uh, have this administration appoint a, a man of global stature, namely Javier Solana, who has been given basically an open check by the European Union, particularly the military division of the called the Western European Union, a 10 nation alliance, he has been really deputized to broker a peace agreement in the Middle East, now more than ever, it is needed for what would be deemed by anyone as obvious reasons. There's a prophecy in the Psalms. It's found in the 83rd Psalm. It's really a prayer slash prophecy for Israel. Just the first five verses of this prayer and this prophecy say, O oh God, do not keep silent. Be not quiet. O oh God, be not still. See how your enemies are astir, how your foes rear their heads. With cunning they conspire against your people. 
They plot against those you cherish. Come, they say, watch this, let us destroy them as a nation that the name of Israel be remembered no more. With one mind, they plot together and they form an alliance against you. Isn't it interesting this Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran, would say, quote, in this Newsmax uh, headline from just a couple of days ago, elimination of Zionist regime is the cure. The article says, quote, but it was Ahmadinejad, his hardline views on Israel, reinvigorated by public backing from Iran's supreme cleric leader, who animated the emergency meeting as it strove to get the Muslim world's voice heard above a diplomatic din. Although the main cure to the situation is the elimination of the Zionist regime, in this stage an immediate ceasefire should be implemented. Ahmadinejad, who previously has said Israel should be wiped off the map, Psalm 83 told the closed door meeting. Islam should be wiped off the map and not be a nation anymore. This church is exactly as the prophets of old foretold it would happen, and it is happening right before our very eyes. Two questions. Are we watching? And are we ready? Are you ready here this morning? Are you watching here this morning? Are you watching these things be fulfilled, and are you readying yourself because these things are being fulfilled? I submit to you that we are watching from all the generations heretofore. We are the one generation that in our lifetime, in my lifetime, at my age, will see, I believe, the return of the Lord in this event called the rapture for his church. Why? Because if Israel is God's prophecy clock, it's not only the 11th hour, it is 11.59 and counting. And the Lord can come for his church at any time in the event we call the rapture. And that's really what Matthew 25 is about. It is about the rapture of the church and being ready. I find it interesting that all ten of these virgins were brides. All ten of them had lamps, but only five of them have the uh, Holy Spirit sealing them for their redemption and readying them for the rapture and for the bridegroom to come. Interesting that ten of them, all ten of them were sealed. I find that interesting. I think that is indicative of where we are corporately, collectively, as a church in this day and age that we live today. I, I, I think it's a little bit of a sad commentary that CNN is teaching more Bible prophecy than some churches. I mean, call me silly, but that is silly to me. That I, that I can turn on CNN and, and I can hear good, solid Bible teaching <laughs> about the last days and the rapture of the church, but I can walk into a church down the street and never hear Bible prophecy being taught. And I would just say, shame on us. Shame on us. That's what I love about teaching the Bible as a pastor teacher from you know, book to book, chapter to chapter, and verse to verse. Because you have to teach chapter 24 in Matthew, and you have to teach chapter 25 in Matthew. Even though it may not be popular. I think that some people unnecessarily stay away from Bible prophecy because they think that it's, quote, too divisive or too controversial. Listen, I've been studying and teaching Bible prophecy for the last 11 years, and I have to tell you that I think this is it. I believe this is it. 
I could be wrong. I don't think I'm wrong. I really believe that this is the time known as the end, and the rapture of the Church of Jesus Christ is going to happen sooner than any of us could possibly even imagine or expect, because he's going to come at an hour that we do not expect him to come. And I think the clarion call before every one of us today is, are there things in our life that have bound us to the things of this earth so that we're not ready and we're not watching? Have we been so busy by the cares and the affairs of this life so as to numb us and even lullaby us to a spiritual slumber like the brides in the parable? So that we're not ready so his coming does catch us off. Well, I want to talk and sort of round the corner here about the rapture, not just that the rapture takes place before the seven-year tribulation, but why it takes place before the seven-year tribulation. See, I think it's not only important to know what we believe, but it's important to know why we believe what we believe. And I think this doctrine of the imminent return, this imminence doctrine, is huge, especially now. I believe that it is important that we not only teach about the rapture, but we teach why it is that the rapture not only happens before the seven year tribulation, but why it has to. I think that teachers who, and believers who do not believe in a rapture before the seven year tribulation do err greatly. And sadly, I'm sad to say, but the proponents of those who teach anything but a pre-tribulation rapture are teaching a false deception that I believe has significant and unthinkable ramifications on the life of a believer because see, if you place the rapture of the church anywhere but before the seven-year tribulation, you delay my Jesus' coming. And I don't know about you, but I don't want my Jesus to delay his coming. If the rapture's in the midpoint of the tribulation, then I'm not looking for Jesus Christ, I'm looking for the Antichrist, and I'm looking for the table to be rebuilt, I'm looking for the abomination of this, I'm looking for all of the above, and that means my master delays is coming. And that's not what I find in the pages of Holy Writ. The seven year tribulation comes after the rapture. It has to, and here's why. First of all, I want to draw your attention to the one place in the scriptures where we have the word rapture in the Bible. Oh, but I thought the word rapture wasn't in the Bible. Oh, it is. It's just not in the English Bible. It's also really not in the Greek Bible. It's actually in the Latin. It's the word rapturus. And it's First Thessalonians, and it's the fourth chapter, and it's probably a, a passage I'm sure you're maybe familiar with, but First Thessalonians chapter 4, perhaps you can turn there with me, and uh, verses 16 through uh, 18, where the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, says, verse 16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be, watch these two words, caught up. English for the Greek word harpazo, which is for the Latin word rapturus, or where we get our transliteration, rapture. So the next time a well-meaning brother or sister in Christ, or the non-believer says to you, the word may actually be mean the bangle. <laughs> they might not say it like that, but just say, yes, it is. It's in the Latin Bible. It's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. It's the English words translated caught up. Okay. I feel better now. I just have to get up my chest. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. There's another allusion to and reference to the rapture found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 52. A little more detail is provided where the Apostle Paul to the church of Corinth says, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in the flash, in the twinkling of an eye, in the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. This is a reference to the rapture of the church. Listen, church, seven reasons, and I put them in the form of an acrostic to help you remember, seven reasons, spelling the word rapture, 
why the rapture has to happen before the seven year tribulation. Reason number one, the revelation to us. Reason number two, the effect upon us. Number three, the purity of us. Number four, the trumpets for us. Number five, the uniformity with us. Number six, the responsibility on us. And number seven, the encouragement from us. And some of you are saying, I'm trying to take notes here. Why did you go so fast? No worries. Again, this is available if you want it on PowerPoint. I'm happy to uh, email you a link so you can download it. But we're going to look at a couple of these today. We won't get through all of them. But I want to draw your attention first to the number one reason why the rapture of the Church of Jesus Christ has to take place before the seven-year tribulation. Because of the revelation to us. The book of Revelation that's given to us. And it reveals for us some interesting, unique to this book, dynamics that you do not find in any other book. The first of which is a unique component found in the first chapter, verse 19. It's been called the Divine Outline, where John on the island of Patmos receives the instruction, the vision, the revelation, and he's told to write, therefore, what you have seen, past, what is now present, and what will take place later, future. So you have this divine outline where John is told to write the revelation that he receives on the island of Patmos and to make it into three different sections, past, present, and future. So that's what he does. The whole book of, Ch of Revelation is divided into past, present, and future. The past, John was an eyewitness of Jesus Christ crucified, resurrected, and seated at the right hand of the Father. He was an eyewitness, and that's what was passed. The book of Revelation was, was written and received in about the year 95 AD. So uh, in 33 AD, for purpose of discussion, Jesus Christ was resurrected. John was there. And so he was told that which he had seen, that which was passed. Chapters 2 and 3 are present. The church history, the seven letters to the church, and everything from chapter 4, verse 1, is all future. Everything from chapter 4, chapter 4 is where Bible scholars place the rapture. Why? After the events of church history. Why? Because in chapter 4, verse 1, John is told to, with the sound of a trumpet call, come up hither. And so he's got now, he's at the throne and he's viewing the events of chapter 6 through 19, with ha which have all to do about the tribulation, he's seeing it from heaven. Not, he's not down here during that. And here's an interesting thing, this is the clincher for me. Verses, uh, uh, chapters 1 through 3, the word church is mentioned 19 times. You do not see the word church from chapter 4 on. You surely don't see the word church in chapter 6 through 19. Why? Because chapter 6 through 19 are about the tribulation. And the church isn't in the tribulation. Because the purpose of the tribulation for the salvation of the Jewish nation. So the church isn't there. The church is where? In heaven. Come up hither. Caught up. Raptured up. After what? After the events of church history, chapters 2 and 3. So you have this divine outline, this chronological order, this beautiful sequence of events where you have past, present, and future. And past and present, the church is mentioned 19 times. And from chapter 4, where, where Bible scholars place the rapture, and chapter 5, then to chapter 6 through 19, you have the seven-year tribulation, and chapter 20, the millennium, and chapters 21 and 22, the new heavens and the new earth. And the church is not even mentioned once. I mean, and the majority of the book is about the seven-year tribulation. Listen, the seven-year tribulation is called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, when Yahweh, Jacob's name, was changed to Israel. It's the time of Israel's trouble, not the time of church's trouble. So the church is not here during the seven-year tribulation. So that's why the revelation, or the rapture of the church, has to happen before the tribulation because of the revelation to us. There's an interesting to, a thing, too, that I want to kind of weave in here. Leviticus 23 gives us the uh, feasts. 
the Levitical feasts that the Israelites, you know, these were holy days, these were celebrations, these were holidays, if you will. They were feasts or festivals, and it was a, an, a festive time. And it's interesting because in the original language of Hebrew of the Old Testament, it's the same word in my native tongue of Arabic. It's the word moad. Moad means an appointed time. That's what the festival was. It was a sign or a time. Just as a sign points you in the right direction to your destination, so too does these feasts point you to the final destination, both the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. And what's really interesting about these seven feasts, like that number seven, is that they were a mere shadow of things to come, the substance of them being found in Christ. See, my shadow is just a shadow that points you to the substance. I create the shadow. The shadow points you to me. If I see somebody walking up behind me and I see their shadow, I'm not looking at their shadow. I'm looking to see what's causing the shadow. That's the cause of these festivals. That was the reason for these festivals. Because again, the Old Testament is all about the person of Jesus Christ. You cannot go to a book in the New Testament and not find your Jesus and my Jesus, Christian. He is all through the Old Testament. And it's all about the person of Jesus Christ, and specifically as these feasts are for his both first and second coming. So there were seven feasts, there were prophetic types or symbols that pointed to Jesus Christ and which would be fulfilled in him. The first four were fulfilled at the first coming. The last three of these seven feasts will be fulfilled at the rapture and the second coming of Christ. The first three feasts are the Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, and they take place in the spring over a period of eight days. The fourth feast, harvest, which is also known by the Greek name Pentecost, the word meaning 50, that's where we get Pentateuch, Pentagon, Pentagram, Pent being five. It's 50 days later at the beginning of the summer. The last three feasts, the Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles, took place over a period of 21 days in the fall of the year. Here they are in chart form if you organize things the way I do in your mind's eye. Uh, the Feast of Passover. And every intricate detail that the Israelites were to follow in celebration of these feasts pointed to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross at his first coming and then subsequently to his second coming. The Passover was a sign, a moab, a festival pointing to Jesus Christ dying on the cross and shedding his blood for the remission of our sins. The Israelites were instructed to take their hyssop branch and dip it in the blood of a, of a spotless lamb that had been sacrificed and to put it on the four posts of the door. Now listen, that was in the shape of a cross. It was at the top of the door, the bottom, the basin, and on each side in the form of a cross. Even the high priests, when they would offer the wave offering, it wasn't the wave offering like, you know, we're, <laughs> like we do. It was in the form of a cross. They would go up and down with the offering before the Lord and side to side in the form of a cross. It all pointed to the person of Jesus Christ. And that's what the Passover was. It was to point to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the unleavened bread, the second piece of three breads, the second person of the Trinity, the burial of Christ, and the first fruits, the resurrection of Christ, and the Pentecost, the birth of the church, and then the Feast of Trumpets is the rapture of the church, and then the Day of Atonement, the tribulation, and then leading up to the salvation of the Jewish nation at the second coming. And the Feast of Tabernacles was the kingdom age and heaven, eternity and future. So the seven feasts all weave in together with the book of Revelation. There's two other components about the book of Revelation that uh, you, you should know about. There's really three unique features to the book of Revelation that most people don't know because you know we've been taught somehow that man, that book of Revelation is a matter of book, you know? <laughs> Just apocalyptic. You know what the word apocalyptic or apocalyptos means? Revealed, unveiled. We think of apocalypse as horrific and awful, and yes it is, but it's unveiling. It means to unveil, to take the cover off. And there's, the three components are not just the divine outline, but it's the only book of all 66 books in the Bible that promises a blessing to those who read it, hear it, and take it to heart. No other book promises that. And the uh, third feature I completely forgot just now. I completely <laughs> forgot it. And it was deeply 
profound, they'll probably come to me at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I don't have time really, so we're going to move very fast here, I think, and try to get through these. But needless to say that the, um, it was coming to me there for a second, but I think I've lost the moment here. So you've got the seven feasts, and you've got this divine outline placed in the book of Revelation. Oh, I know it was. It just came to me. Wow. It's the, <laughs> the book of Revelation has more references to the Old Testament than any other book in the Bible. Some Bible scholars believe that almost two-thirds or even more of the book of Revelation is actually a reference to the Old Testament. And no other New Testament book has that feature or that component. It's been said that if you really love your people, they'll teach you the book of Revelation. If you really love your people, you teach the book of Revelation. I would say to you, Christian, this get a good commentary on the book of Revelation and study it. It is the only book. You'll be so blessed. It is the only book that promises a blessing to those who read it, hear it, and take it to heart. So why does the rapture have to happen before the seven-year tribulation? Because of the revelation to us. Because in the book of Revelation, the word church is found 19 times in chapters 1, 2, and 3 dealing with past and present. And nowhere is the word church found in chapter 6 through 19, which have everything to do with the seven-year tribulation. So the rapture has to happen because of the seven-year, uh, because of the revelation to us. Reason number two, the effect upon us. So the R in our acrostic is revelation to us. The A in our acrostic is the effect upon us. In our study of Matthew chapter 24, Verses 36 through 43, we find the common denominator being, be ready. We've seen it even in our study of chapter 25 so far with this first parable. You see, in verse 36, Jesus says again, No one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. See, if the rapture doesn't happen before the seven-year tribulation, then I do know the day or hour. I know the day because it's 1260 days, it's, at, it's three and a half years. I mean, there's a specific timeline during the seven year tribulation. I know it's going to be in the seventh year. If it's at the end, I know it's going to be in the third, three and a half years if it's in the middle. So Jesus cannot be talking about a rapture that happens anywhere but before the seven year tribulation. See, not knowing the day or hour affects how we spend our time because it could be any time. See, not or knowing the time, mid or post, affects my urgency because I can still have time, you see. So it has an effect on me. It is a positive effect that it has on me. In verses 37 through 39, remember from our study, where Jesus likens it unto the days of Noah. And he says, before the rapture, it will be business as usual right up to the time. It's not going to be business as usual right up to the midpoint of the tri tribulation, nor is it going to be business as usual right up to the end of the tribulation. But like in our day, it is business as usual. People, there's no urgency. We have fallen asleep as the bride in our parable. And we still think we have time, and that my master isn't really coming, and I'm not really expecting him to come. And then in verses 40 through 43, if I'm one who is waiting, watching, and expecting his coming, it won't be a surprise. I won't be caught off guard. Because I know that his coming could be at any moment. If I'm one who is not waiting, not watching, and I'm not ready, his coming will be a surprise. And this is where Jesus has two people in the field. One's taken the air left. Two women grinding to the mill. One taken, one left. That could be nothing other than the rapture. We, we need to occupy until he comes. And we need to be ready so that when he comes, it's not a surprise. Jesus in Luke's Gospel, chapter 17, verses 28 through 30, said, It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Again, I love Dave Hunt, uh, whom I believe is one of the best Bible scholars out there today, he said, quote, these world conditions at the rapture could only be before the tribulation period. They certainly could not be at its conclusion. The whole point is, and God's whole design is, the effect upon us. And I don't think that's 
any clearer than the way it was demonstrated in the last parable of chapter 24 that we looked at last week, which is 44 through 51, where Jesus contrasts two servants. He says, the one says, my master's going to delay his coming, so he parties on and lives a rowdy life. No hurry, no worry. He contrasts that one with the one who says, you know what, I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. My master could come at any time. And he was the one that was found faithful. He was the one that was found watching. And he was the one that was found waiting. Why does the rapture have to take place before the seven-year tribulation? Because of the profound effect it has on you and me and how we live our lives in this temporary and brief life like a vapor. Let's be honest. If you and I really believe that the rapture of the Church of Jesus Christ that happened this afternoon, don't you think it would change the complexion of our plans even a little bit for the upcoming <laughs> day? How about if Jesus was coming for us this week, or this month, or this year? Don't you think that's going to have a pretty profound effect on how you and I live our lives? I think it's going to alter our schedule a little bit, maybe. That's God's design, and that's what I see as the common denominator with these parables and these teachings. And Jesus is constantly saying, be ready, be watching. Be found faithful, because you don't know. Nobody knows the day or the hour. So because you don't know the day or the hour, you need to be ready all the time. That's an interesting dynamic, because it really forces us to always live in that imminent return, with that expectancy of that imminent return. The last one we're going to look at today is the P in our cross. The purity of us, the revelation to us, the effect upon us, and the purity of us. And this one is huge, and this is how we're going to partake of communion today. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, the Apostle John says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But what we know, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. See, the belief of a pre-tribulation rapture has a purifying effect on us. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, the Apostle Paul, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin bride to him. Jesus is the bridegroom, and we are the bride. And this is our parable. The parable that we have before us today is about brides who are purified and ready for their groom to come and snatch them away. And you have to understand that in Jewish thought, this analogy, this comparison of a bridegroom and a bride would have been very understood. Because their bridal customs in that day are not like our bridal customs today. The Jewish bridal customs were very interesting. As we'll see in a moment, the bridegroom would come at an hour that the bride did not expect. And you know how long they would celebrate their wedding? Seven days. In Hebrew, the word seven, Shavuah, is a period of seven. It's not limited to seven days. It could be seven weeks, 70 weeks. Seven years, it's a period of seven. And so this is very much congruent with and fits with the rapture of the church being the bridegroom who comes for the bride. So here it is. Let me take you through a uh, little Jewish wedding here. Uh, not a little one. <laughs> Maybe a really big one. In the Jewish wedding, the groom's father makes the match, the shidduchim, and chooses the bride, and the groom approves of the choice. In our way, our Heavenly Father chooses us the bride, and Jesus approves the choice. In the Jewish wedding, a marriage covenant, known as the kaduba, is made in writing with the bride as a promise to the bride to be fulfilled. 
That's in our wedding to the Lamb, a new covenant that is made and written in the form of the Word of God. It's for us as His bride, and it's promised to us, and it fulfills for us the Old Covenant. Now, in the Jewish wedding, they would then break bread and drink from the same cup to seal the betrothal, the kiddushin, and the new covenant, because marriage is a covenant. He breaks the bread in our wedding and drinks from the cup at the Last Supper, sealing his covenant with us. In the Jewish wedding, the groom pays a price, the mohab, showing the bride his love for her. In our wedding to our bridegroom, Jesus paid the price for us on the cross, and this shows us the bride how much he loves us. Now, in the Jewish wedding, the groom makes a speech, a promise to his bride that he would come for her soon. He has to go away. He's going to come again. Sound familiar at all just a little bit? Well, in our wedding to the Lamb, Jesus' speech, his words, his word is recorded as a promise to us as his bride that he will come again soon. This is all wedding language. This is all bridal talk that Jesus, our bridegroom, is saying to us when he said to them, then his disciples. Then in the Jewish wedding, the groom prepares a place for his bride and builds a room addition on his father's house. You can go to Israel today and you can see the, the architecture of the Jewish homes. They have room additions. That's like us here in Hawaii. <laughs> a lot of, the, the group brings his bride back home and lives with mom and dad, you know, and one big happy ohana. Well, that's what Jesus was saying when he was saying, Behold, I go prepare a place for you. In my Father's house there's many mansions. And if it were not so, I would not have told you. And I'm going to come again for you, my bride, as your bridegroom. And that's what He's meaning when he says that. Well, it gets even more interesting, because in the Jewish wedding, the father is the only one who knows the day or the hour of the groom's return for his bride. Not even the groom knows. The father made the match. The father chose the bride, even in my Arab culture today. In fact, I, I started a whole family feud in my Arab family because I didn't marry the one that was chosen for me. They had prearranged marriages. And, they, and this is what it is. And God chose us to be his bride. So in our wedding, Jesus said that no one but the Father knows the day or the hour of his return for us as his bride. Again, that's why we have to be ready. In the Jewish wedding, the groom gives the bride love gifts, known as Matan. Jesus, our groom, gives us his bride gifts of love, eternal life, and peace. By the way, all these scripture references are here if you're writing them down. Though Jewish wedding, the Father gives the bride gifts uh, also, Shilohim, uh, to equip her for her new life as an inheritance. We are given the gifts of the Holy Spirit as spiritual gifts for our new life in Him. That's what the gifts of the Spirit are for. That's the Jewish bridal custom for the father to give the bride these gifts. In the Jewish wedding, the bride's unmarried friends attend to the bride and provide light for the groom who comes at night. Just as our wedding, we prepare the bride by letting our light shine, the oil, so the bride is ready for the groom who will come as a thief in the night. And in the Jewish wedding, the bridegroom comes, the groomsmen run ahead and shout a midnight call in our parable, he's coming. When our bridegroom comes, it will be with a shout of the trumpet that Jesus is coming. In fact, the best man in a Jew, Jewish bride, bridal custom sounds the trumpet. That's the trumpet call. And that's what we're going to look at, Lord willing, next week, is the trumpet's chorus. There are different trumpets. There's trumpets for Israel, and there's trumpets for the church. There's a trumpet of God, and there's a trumpet of angels. There's a first trumpet and a last trumpet. And we're going to look at those trumpets and distinguish why it is that the trumpets for us, this is where a lot of people get really mixed up. The trumpets that are for us, it is for the church, and it is the trumpet of a bridal procession of the bridegroom coming. That's, you know, trumpets is how they communicate. They have email or cell phones or any of that. that. You know, trumpets for battle, you know, there were different trumpet cadences and, and sounds and tunes that would say different things and communicate different things. Well, the groom snatches away and abducts his bride as a thief in the night. Just as we're going to be abducted, 
snatched away, caught up, harpazo, raptured away as he abducts us. In the Jewish wedding, the groom takes his bride to the bridal chamber where they consummate and celebrate the Nisalim, their wedding for a Shavua, seven, a period of seven, seven days. In other words, while we're consummating and celebrating our marriage to the Lamb, the world is tribulating for seven years. This is why the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ has to happen before that period of seven years known as the Great Tribulation. Because anything else doesn't fit Jesus' teachings and warnings to us. In the Jewish wedding, the party waits outside until the groom tells the best man that it's consummated. And then the guests rejoice for another period of seven, seven days. During the seven day or slash year celebration, the world goes through the seven day tribulation. Then they have a big wedding feast, huge wedding feast, and it's after the wedding celebration. And we too will go to the Father's house for what is called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Lastly, there were three groups present at the wedding, the groom and the bride and the wedding guests. There are also three groups of people in the marriage of the Lamb, the groom, Jesus, the bride, the church, and the guests, those saved after the rapture. Now, some of you might have this question. Is it possible to get saved after the rapture? Yes. It's not going to be easy. If you're not going to, if one said, live for Christ before, what makes you think you're going to die for him after? It's going to be extremely difficult and require martyrdom to give your life to Jesus Christ and not accept the mark of the Antichrist in the seven year tribulation. But you have to make a distinction. They're wedding guests. They're not seated as the bride with the groom on the throne. They're serving as servants at the throne. The book of Revelation makes that distinction. They're tribulation saints. They're not the bride. Make that distinction. Those who are born again of the Spirit of God are the bride of Christ. Those that go up in the rapture as the bridegroom abducts his bride. But those that get saved after the rapture are not the bride. They're still saved, but they're not the bride. Instead of being with the Lord on the throne, they're serving the Lord at the throne. And please make that distinction, and I hope that might answer an unanswered question. Well, today we're going to uh, partake of communion as we do on the first Sunday of each month. And I want to read you one thing about the communion and what it meant in the context of the, the bridal customs in Jewish thought. See, to anyone who hears the message of the Passah, the Gospel, it is a wedding proposal by God to accept him and be a part of his bride. God desires that we accept his invitation and give him our response of, I do. In fact, in Revelation 22, 20, it's a proposal by Yeshua himself to accept him and be a part of his bride. His message in his verses come the way the bride said, I do, was to take the cup and break bread. The way I say, I do, to the Messiah's marriage proposal is to partake of his cup and broken bread. Have you ever known communion to be an acceptance of a wedding proposal, a marriage proposal from our bridegroom as his bride? That's what it is. When he proposes, Will you marry me? The way she would answer would be to partake of the bread and the cup and break bread together. What a wedding proposal, huh? I, I proposed to my wife in a helicopter and uh, she uh, didn't really know that I was going to ask her to marry me and I didn't know that she was afraid of heights. <laughs> and uh, when I asked her to marry me, we had these helmets on with the microphone and and I said, will you marry me? No. <laughs> and all, all I could hear on the other end of the, uh, the mic microphone was, <laughs> I thought, oh, isn't that sweet? Only to learn later that she was crying because she wanted to get out of the helicopter. But <laughs> I would have said anything to accept the proposal. But this is Jesus proposing a marriage to us as the bride. And so when we partake of communion today, in so doing, what we are saying is, I do. I do. I accept. So as we partake today, I, I just pray that it would be, for those of you who are already born again of the Spirit of God, that it would be your way of saying, I do. His proposal 
of marriage for all eternity. And if you're not today, sure that you're born again of the Spirit of God and you have oil in your lamp. This is a great time to do it. The Lord is extending to you the cup, the bread. And to partake of it, see, even in my culture, when you would partake of bread and a cup, we all ate the same, from the same bread. I mean, we double dipped in everything. And, and we would drink from the same cup. I'll never forget as a kid seeing my Arab family breaking bread and eating with their hands. And it was six one half dozen the other because my germs or your germs were one. And that's the point, that you become one. And that's what the communion is all about, the two becoming one. When we say, I do and accept the way of the closing. So with that, I'm going to have Lady to Michelle come up and we'll uh, close in worship and partake together. And typically what we do is, um, you know, have you come up and get the uh, cup and get the bread and then go back to your uh, seat and don't partake yet so we can uh, partake uh, together. So uh, let's close with a word of prayer and just ask God to bless our time together uh, at His table. Lord, we are uh, blessed we are really privileged. It's, it's really amazing that we're the bride and that you propose your marriage to us in this way. What a profound truth that we've seen from your word today. I pray that it has an encouraging effect on us to encourage us in the days in which we live as hard as it is the days in which we live. I know many people are going through some really difficult trials. And I just pray that today is a way in which you can just get our eyes off of our circumstances, off of our lives here on this earth, and that you would be the lifter of our head, as the psalm says, and that you would point us heaven, that in our hearts we might belong for your people. That we might say, even so, not enough. Lord, come quickly. Come and take us. Take us to your bridal chamber, that we might be with you forever. Our love, the lover of our soul, our people. We love you, Jesus. We love you so much.